Uh, thank you. Uh, it's good to be back in my second home, as I like to call NSMC and CNA, CMA. I'm often asked how many times I have been here, and I can honestly say I've been here so many times I can't recall, but it's a number greater probably than 10. And always it's a pleasure to interact with Professor Shu and uh, others within uh, NSMC. Uh, we've had a long and fruitful relationship uh, from, uh, for many years, uh, and that relationship continues to grow and I think uh, serve us all very well. What I will do here is just give you an introduction to satellite capabilities. This will not be a uh, lecture that will go into the scientific depth that uh, Dr. Menzel's lecture went into. I will get into more scientific depth as my lectures go along, and the one on now casting and deep convection, uh, you'll need to listen very, very carefully. Uh, but our satellite capabilities have increased dramatically uh, over the years, so that now we have a very robust uh, global observing system that can do a number of uh, things. So what do I want to do in this lecture? Uh, I want to familiarize you with the current and future space-based component of the global observing system. I will review with you the various orbits uh, that we use in, uh, for meteorological and environmental applications. I'll speak about the four critical resolutions that you must consider when you're using a satellite system. We'll take a look at some different examples and then the remainder of the China lectures. Uh, this is the first Tyros image that was taken uh, April the 1st, 1960. It was the beginning of the weather satellite era. It's one that's very well uh, recognized uh, by meteorologists. Uh, part of the area shown here is uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, these first satellites were uh, stabilized by spinning but also pointed at a fixed star as they went around the Earth. So their viewing of the Earth changed as a function of time. It made them very difficult to navigate. Uh, they were not calibrated. They were Viticon uh, type instruments. They only saw the broadband visible portion of the spectrum. But after seeing this, it was immediately realized uh, the capabilities that would be there as the satellite system grew. And then with the advances in computer technology, or computers, information technology, the ability to transfer data, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, microelectronics over the past uh, 40 years, capabilities of satellites have uh, grown dramatically. So what are we doing 45 years later? or over 45 years later. And I'll let you read this, but now we use multiple spectral bands to interrogate the atmosphere to find out things about clouds, the land surface, uh, and sea surface properties are induced. Uh, we can get very high resolution uh, renderings of sea surface temperature. We can monitor the ozone hole and its changes as a function of time. We have exceptionally high resolution views of uh, severe thunderstorms. And, and when I talk about this, we'll uh, talk about a geostationary viewing perspective, where actually we look at the bottom of the storm, the side, and the top of the storm, basically a three-dimensional picture of the storm itself. We've revolutionized uh, tropical storm and hurricane forecasting with satellites. And now we have uh, satellites in various orbits uh, around the globe that are providing a wealth of information that we use on a routine basis. Satellites are essential for forecasting uh, the weather today across the globe. And indeed, modern day NWP would never be able to do the type of uh, renderings of the state of the atmosphere that they do without satellite data. 
Satellite data are now the backbone of modern numerical weather prediction systems. A variety of applications, and they span again from climate to land applications. We even do ecological applications, uh, ocean and meteorological. Very much the heart of GEOS will be satellites. There's unparalleled international collaboration within our global space-based observing system through all the modern uh, countries throughout the world. And again, you can see just the variety of satellites that there are, both research satellites and operational satellites now make up the global observing system and in fact research satellite data has become an integral part of what we do in uh, modern utilization of satellite data. I would just remind you of the ocean surface winds that we uh, had from QuickSCAT, from the ERS satellite series, from the MBSAT series of satellites. Those are research satellites, they are not operational. We've enjoyed the ocean surface winds for a number of years and now we have hyperspectral resolution uh, sounding data that is used in modern NWP systems from uh, research satellites such as AIRS. So research satellites are of lifetimes now of several years and those data are routinely used uh, by uh, weather forecasters. And in fact in China, I know that you received the uh, data from the Aqua as well as the Terra satellites and make redistribution of those on a routine basis. This is the geostationary constellation of satellites that are available today. Uh, the constellation Paul showed uh, had hundreds of satellites in geostationary orbit. Most of those are uh, communication satellites. These are the meteorological satellites. The locations aren't to the exact decimal point, but we can see that over your hemisphere, there are numerous uh, geostationary satellite observations uh, providing uh, information. FY2 uh, at 86 and 105 East, you have GMS out here at 140. Meteosat 6 at 63 East. These one two, three, four satellites actually are a backbone of digital data that is multi-channel that provides an incredible amount of information across through here. And these are distributed on a routine basis. Then in the hemisphere of the U.S. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the, or the western hemisphere, I should say, we don't have near the coverage of geostationary satellites that you do in the Eastern Hemisphere. You're very rich. Uh, there are also a number of uh, polar orbiting satellites, the NOAA satellites, the FY satellites, uh, the Terra and Aqua constellations, uh, TRIM, uh, which is not in a polar orbit, it's in a prograde orbit, and there are very good reasons you use prograde orbits. I will try to explain that to you a little bit. Uh, we have uh, things like Jason for, wet, for altimetry or giving us precise sea level height to within centimeter or less. Uh, we have the uh, ERS and the QuickScat for winds. We have the new Cosmic system which is providing GPS occultation soundings that really are going to, when they're blended with hyperspectral data, revolutionize how we can use that data for NWP, but also how well we can define the vertical structure of the atmosphere at appropriate scale. Then we have a series of research satellites, many of them dealing with uh, land surface applications, and some at exceptionally high resolution, such as SPOT, uh, Landsat, and the uh, IRSP-4. The satellite system today has uh, come to uh, evolve into a very different satellite system than that of uh, the era where I began uh, my career in meteorology. 
uh, perhaps before some of you in this room were born. Uh, we've moved into a high resolution digital age. That's very important because when you can digitize the data, you can go in and interrogate it and make multi-spectral products that are really very uh, robust. We can launch into precision orbits. And the launch into precision orbits is important for, for two applications. One is uh, extending the lifetime of the satellite. Obviously, in polar orbit, if we can launch into precision orbits, we don't drift out of the local equator crossing time that we want before the instruments die. So we're able to use it better uh, for operational applications, but also for climate applications, it gives us the ability to extend uh, the climate record because we're looking more over the same time period with the orbit. Uh, as I explained, both operational and research satellites are now making up the global observing system and their data are transmitted globally uh, routinely over the GTS and through other areas such as ATOVS retransmission systems. Uh, the European ATOVS retransmission system set the stage for this, providing uh, data on the GTS within 30 minutes of those uh, satellites taking the observations for NWP, and now there is a uh, ATOVS type retransmission system being developed throughout Asia and the Pacific that will provide near real time uh, data from that system for global NWP. So again, meeting the demands of that system are very important. Uh, Multi-platform and multi-sensor products are now uh, available. Uh, no one in their right mind, uh, maybe a few people in their right mind, but not very many, would use a single satellite to do the total analysis that they would want to do of something like a hurricane or of the uh, ocean uh, topography or ocean uh, uh, dynamics and moisture field. It's a multiple observing system, just like the, it's a multiple observing system for normal uh, weather applications where you look at aircraft data, you look at s surface observations, upper air observations, and blend those together. So it's multiple platform, multiple sensor. There are massive changes in the way we do business. And those changes will become much more uh, rapid and much more difficult uh, over time. But the opportunity that's provided will be uh, magnificent. Uh, there are going to be changes in the way we do data handling. I don't think you'll try to do all the data all the time, but you'll be intelligent in that manner. Uh, science and product development, uh, something that operational people probably will hate to see but I do believe that you will see a robust changing uh, product stream and that will require training and uh, utilization on a continual basis so that the users can keep up with those changes and improvements in products. Nobody wants to be using a product that's five years old in its technology when there's a much better product available today. But again, you have to train the people in how to do that. That's one of the reasons for the virtual laboratory for satellite data utilization that Professor Xu uh, mentioned earlier and that China is playing a uh, very dynamic role in that virtual lab. Let's take a look at uh, changes in technology. Uh, previous uh, satellites up to about, in, at least in the US system, up to about the year 2000 or so, we couldn't launch into near as precision orbits as we do today because of the technology with the launch vehicle. And in fact, we would launch our, our satellites so they would drift to avoid uh, having the sun interfere with their sensors. Uh, and you can see what orbital drift was like uh, prior to the NOAA 16 satellite. Uh, this is NOAA 14. Uh, now these time steps in here or every uh, 15 minutes. But you can see, and this, this is one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. From the initial launch of NOAA 14 out to the near end of lifetime, which is five years or so, so right out in here, you had a drift in orbital time of two hours. 
which really changes your ability to use that data for climate uh, purposes because you're look, looking at a different time of the diurnal cycle over time and you have to take that into account. With the NOAA 16 satellite, the launch of the orbit was into a 1400 time with the initial drift over the first uh, two years being so it would go less in time and then gradually begin to, begin to increase so that by the time you got to near uh, five years, your time from initial launch was only 30 minutes for local solar time. So that's quite a, that's, and why does an orbit drift? Well, the orbits drift because of the Earth's magnetic field uh, causing torque on the uh, satellite. It's not a uniform field. Maybe one of the most interesting things I did years ago was look at a map of the surface topography of the Earth that's depicted as a magnetic field, or, or not the magnetic, the uh, gravitational field, sorry, the gravitational field. It is amazing the variability uh, in the Earth's gravitational field, and indeed when you do advanced applications of, uh, of certain types, you actually watch the satellite accelerate and decelerate as it goes through different parts of the orbital field or gravitational field changing height. But that combined with the solar wind causes the satellites to drift in time, so there's no way to get around it. You can't launch a satellite that will not be in a polar orbit that, that it's going to drift. But you can launch into a position on this curve that will then let you help control the useful lifetime of that satellite through precision launching into orbits. So that's one of the advanced capabilities. And now some satellites such as uh, Aqua and CloudSat and other ones actually have rockets that allow them to uh, maintain a very stable orbit for a long period of time. Research satellite data are used for operational purposes. The first of this started with the, uh, the ERS and the quick scat types of data for ocean surface winds. Now in NWP, uh, AIRS data are used uh, routinely. Uh, this is NWP, the coverage of that hyperspectral resolution data that Paul showed uh, from AIRS. Uh, and this has been uh, shown to have a very positive impact, uh, certainly at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, uh, very, very positive impact. And we're just learning how to use it. Once NWP models become mature enough, to utilize real information on clouds, uh, we will see another uh, step forward in this. But it's the it is <laughs> the the interesting thing that I like to say about uh, use of satellite data in NWP. We really need to have the NWP models and their assimilation systems become mature enough to utilize the satellite data correctly. And that means lots of research and lots of work needs to be done in NWP and data assimilation to properly utilize the satellite data. Once a satellite uh, center has, uh, uh, or satellite and operational agency have put together a program to do that, you begin to see massive increases. And in fact, while I was the director of the Office of Research at NOAA NESDES, we joined together with the uh, NCEP, National Center for Environmental Prediction within the National Weather Service, and created a joint center for satellite data utilization. And through that joint center of satellite data assimilation, we've attacked uh, or approached in a scientific manner, very specific problems that we knew needed to be overcome to improve the utilization of satellite data in NWP and have made remarkable steps forward. They're available to the global community and in fact we work on a routine basis with, uh, with ECMWF and the uh, uh, meteorological office in, uh, in the United Kingdom 
uh, on improving the use of satellite data in NWP very, very closely. Uh, and there are a number of things that need to be done. For example, the uh, number of observations <laughs> within this field of view or within this uh, orbital time frame are huge. And what NWP centers do today is called thin the data. And that means because they can't handle the data flow and can't get it through the computer and the assimilation system, they only use about one in every five or seven data points. So they may miss exactly the uh, region that, they, that you would want to see because they've had to throw that data out. One of the things that we're working on within the Joint Center is intelligent thinning, where you don't thin the data the same uh, globally, but you uh, thin it selectively. Uh, that requires some uh, really uh, difficult changes in the assimilation system. And it's only going to get bigger as more hyperspectral instruments uh, begin to orbit the planet along with microwave instruments. And once you determine how to utilize the data in NWP and utilize microwave and uh, hyperspectral data over land, the volumes are going to increase dramatically, absolutely dramatically. So there is a lot of work that has to be done. So it's not uh, one person job. And you can see that if you're familiar with the, um, with the, a map of the world, and you should just go look at a map of the world because I'm always amazed. We say 70% uh, of the ocean is covered by, or 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. Well, that may be true for the whole world, but if you look north of the equator versus south of the equator, there's almost twice as much land in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. And so the ability to use satellite data over land in the northern hemisphere for NWP becomes a driving need that does not exist in the southern hemisphere. Um, multiple platforms are used for various types of analyses. And let's just take a look at the information from multiple platforms here. We have passive and active microwave radiometry. Let's go and just look at a hurricane, uh, giving us information on the wind field. We come in and look at our sea surface temperatures because the energy to drive that, these storms is very much dependent on SST, but you want that SST to be warm over a deep layer. So altimetry data becomes important in defining the deep, warm, uh, ocean areas that can support uh, tropical storms much better. You have a tropical storm such as this one we can observe with one minute imagery uh, or very frequently with our geostationary satellite data and actually see the rotation uh, within that storm. We can, with the current GO system, we can actually measure the winds going around or cloud motion vectors going around that uh, eye wall. Um, as this spins at very high uh, speeds and goes over the ocean, there's mixing. That mixing brings up water from below, right? Upwelling. And so knowing that you have a deep region that you're going over here with a lot of warm water, the upwelling will not leave cold water behind it that may uh, interfere with another tropical storm. Whereas if you go over a region like this, where you have a sharp gradient and there's probably cool water or, or not a deep, moist, deep, warm region here, you could imagine that you can leave a cold wake even back in that uh, warm area and make a difference in hurricane in, or typhoon intensity. Multiple platform, multiple analysis, but you've got to use the old brain to help you get there. Uh, we have our atmospheric motion vectors at mid uh, levels that show us very well the flow patterns in the atmosphere. These interact with the tropical storm uh, to tell you if you're going to be on this side of a ridge and you'll keep moving that way 
or will you get close enough to the trough that you're going to recurve? You don't have data out over the oceans in any uh, detail. These cloud motion vectors are exceptionally important in doing that. Finally, we have microwave sounding units, a microwave that takes observations from the satellites and if you look at this uh, profile here, it's strange looking, but it's a temperature anomaly cross section. So what you do is you take the broad scale derived temperature field, you subtract the mean of that field across the line and you see very quickly the hot warm core of the uh, tropical storm that's helping drive the pressure drop. These areas right here that are blue that are much colder are where you have rainfall. There is a wealth of information available from a satellite or satellite system to do multiple platform analysis of hurricanes, tropical storms, uh, severe storms, uh, waves, uh, tropical, tropical waves, uh, the position and things going on within the May front, uh, knowing where the troughs and ridges are in the atmosphere, understanding the dynamics that's going on, it's all there and it's going to get more and more uh, quantitative and easier to use. Changing the do way we do business, uh, I mentioned to you the European uh, ATOVS uh, retransmission system where data is received from a number of ground stations immediately sent to a central processing site and then broadcast globally. This is uh, getting data very timely into NWP for their uses and this is going to happen almost on a global basis over the next two years through an integrated global data dissemination system. Let's take a quick look now at uh, orbits. The mainstay orbits for meteorological applications have uh, evolved over the years and they're very robust, the sun-synchronous polar orbit and the geostationary orbit. There are other orbits uh, and specialized applications that occur within these orbits. Uh, the other orbit that is uh, mainly used is a prograde orbit. Now, why would you use a prograde orbit? I mean, these polar orbits, uh, those data go around and cross at the same local sun time every day as they go around the Earth. And what that gives you is an alias data set because your observations are always at the same time of day, okay? If I'm trying to measure something with tidal influences, for example, I don't want to be in an alias orbit. I want to be in an orbit that crosses at many, many different times to help get my uh, ocean topography where I won't have tidal influences uh, in my data set. So I go into a prograde orbit. The other thing is if I want to fly a low Earth orbiting satellite and look at rainfall using microwave, Either I want to fly many, many in polar orbit if I have an active sensor, or I want to fly in a prograde orbit where I will cover the diurnal cycle over some uh, time frame. But also underfly or fly uh, crossing orbits with my polar system so I can calibrate them with my active sensor. So that's why you do the uh, prograde orbit. Also, if you're studying Earth radiation budget, you don't want that thing to be in a polar orbit. That gives you alias observations. You see in the clouds and the Earth's surface and all at the same diurnal time. So you want to be in a prograde orbit where you average over a long time, you cover all equator crossing times and, and get the diurnal cycle. That's why uh, the Earth radiation budget uh, mission, for example, was in a uh, prograde orbit. Um, Constellations, we'll cover those in a minute. This is the polar orbit. Uh, they cover uh, twice a day generally. Uh, one uh, observation in the morning time, one in the afternoon time. Uh, they're launched at altitudes and uh, inclination angles uh, to accomplish this. Usually it's 12 plus maybe 12 and a half uh, orbits per day with repeat cycles on the uh, ground tracks of uh, several days. They have uh, visible and infrared microwave imagers as well as infrared and microwave sounders. And that's because you're closer to the Earth, you can use an instrument of a reasonable size and get the radiation that you need 
uh, to do the job. Also, the prograde orbits with active sensors are lower in the atmosphere because you're putting down a pulse. You need to get the reflection back. And so your uh, altimeters or your scatterometers are naturally in low Earth orbits. The geostationary orbits are so that you have global coverage from the uh, polar, from the geostationary orbits. You have local coverage over a single uh, point of the Earth uh, or a single hemisphere uh, with observations taken anywhere from uh, one minute for local areas to generally 30 minutes or 15 minutes for a full disk image. These are put together to make the animations uh, that you all see and to derive a number of products. Uh, they're used to monitor storms and uh, so forth. Uh, mainly their use is now casting the determination of atmospheric motion vectors, although with the different channels that you have, they're very good to use to verify NWP forecast by the location of troughs, ridges, and where vorticity centers would be, for example. And those are very easily seen in satellite data. We've been doing that for a, uh, a number of years. They're a 24-hour orbital period and are about 36,000 kilometers above the, uh, above the Earth. And uh, the, these satellites don't see the polar regions. In fact, they see very high resolution at their subpoint. And it drops off, but it doesn't drop off. People may think it goes to uh, 10 or 20 miles from a one kilometer resolution once you get out to the edge. That's not the case. It only drops off by a factor of two or three. But you all, where you become tangent to the Earth edge from this satellite, your tangent point is at about 72 degrees north south. They're like a ring. So you just don't see beyond that because it doesn't cover uh, beyond that. I haven't had any yet, so this is fine. Thank you. Shoot, shoot. These are some of the comparisons of uh, geostationary and low Earth orbiting satellite capabilities. And, and they are merging. Um, we are starting to get instruments on the geostationary satellites very complementary to the polar satellites, so we can some of these. But the Low Earth orbiting satellites, because of the infrequency of their observations, only observe the effect of what happened. They don't see it happen. But with the geostationary satellite, we actually observe the process as it happens. And that will become very important when I talk to you uh, next week about now casting. Because we observe the process and you have to understand that process when you use the geostationary satellite. Uh, and then you can see some of the uh, other characteristics. We're generally lower uh, resolution, especially in the infrared portion of the spectrum. Uh, we have greater diffraction because you're further away. You need uh, larger telescopes. Um, you can repeat every 30 minutes or less, whereas a repeat is about 12 hours. Full disk, local coverage, global coverage and uh, so forth. I won't bore you with uh, things that you can read on your own and already know. The prograde orbit, I already spoke to that. The trim is in the prograde orbit. They have narrow swaths, but they also have active radar. <coughs> For example, you can actually look at the structure and rainfall uh, out of uh, clouds from those, and they can be used to calibrate the microwave sensors on the polar orbiting satellites. Uh, I would uh, mention to you that there's a global precipitation mission that's planned in a, uh, several years. I can't give you the exact date. It's a NASA uh, mission. I think it's in cooperation with JAXA. Uh, that will be in a 53 degrees uh, prograde orbit, whereas TRIM is only in like a 30 degree prograde orbit. So it will cover much uh, further north. And will be a very important part of calibrating our uh, polar uh, system. And I'll talk about intercalibration. I don't think I talk about it in this lecture. I think it's when I do spectral bands, bands and their applications. Another uh, important orbit is, uh, it's not really an orbit, but another important uh, consideration 
is flying satellites that have uh, are at, in the same polar orbit with slightly offset equator crossing times which gives them the same ground track. So one looks exactly at one ground track and five minutes later perhaps another one comes along that exact same ground track. This is uh, what you see here is the aqua satellite followed very closely in time by CloudSat and Calypso so that when aqua looks at a cloud field uh, the cloud sat comes over and in a very narrow swath gives you de a detailed radar depiction of that cloud and then Calypso comes over with a LIDAR giving you aerosols and also giving you very accurate uh, cloud heights uh, from that. Then they're followed by chemistry uh, type satellites. Now you might think, oh my goodness, they're only separated by one minute. Perhaps they're going to run together. Uh, actually the satellites in polar orbits generally move about 3.5 miles every, every uh, minute. So these are separated in orbit by at least 3 miles, and these are separated in an orbit by almost a mile. So they're, no, they're not going to run together. I think that when we look at constellations and formation flying, that this is the future that we will move to for our polar orbiting satellite systems because it gives you the flexibility to have an instrument fail on a satellite and not have to launch the entire satellite to replace that instrument but only a small new part of that formation that might carry the instrument that failed plus a few good research instruments. This means a change in the way we do business because it's not the same set of instruments on the same bus. It means a flexible bus. And the bus, when I say the word bus, I mean the platform that carries the instruments for the satellite. It's a different way of doing business. It's a different thinking. Spacecraft vendors may not like this at first, but it is really the way to the future. It also allows us to take our operational satellites and put research missions close behind or in front of that operational satellite to help learn better how to use the operational satellite data but also to plan for future uh, satellite uh, sensors for our operational system. Also it means for the research satellites you don't need to put on the AVHRR and the sounder and some of the other instruments that are already on the operational satellite you can tailor the uh, application of that research satellite specifically to what it needs to do and fly perhaps a much better instrument for the same price. So there are huge advantages to going into formation flight in polar orbits. Constellations, uh, the one that has me extremely excited right now is the GPS occultation the system where the GPS satellites looks at rising and setting occultations. Uh, from that, they determine the bending angle through the atmosphere because of the change in transmission time to the GPS satellite. And because the speed of light is a function of the density of the medium through which it travels, you can actually do to what's called tomography and go in and determine the uh, vertical structure of the atmosphere. About a half kilometer resolution uh, to within much better than a degree centigrade accuracy across the path, but the path uh, can be about 200 kilometers. So it's not representative of a spot. It's representative of an inverted cone through uh, the atmosphere with this. But if you get enough GPS up there, you can certainly do magnificent soundings down to uh, certainly 850 millibar level. This is where NWP has to come in and play an important role because it's the analysis system that will be able to blend in data with different characteristics. A 200 kilometer path length here versus a 14 kilometer wide uh, hyperspectral uh, resolution uh, radiance information. 
how you blend those together can give you very high uh, resolution uh, data in about the atmosphere's particle structure. That's very, very exciting for a number of applications. And GPS, speed of light, doesn't care if there's a cloud there or not. It cares if there's moisture there, but not the cloud. Speed of light is a function of virtual temperature. Okay? Okay. Now, where, what are we going to get over the next 10 years? Uh, Multi-channel, multi-spectral imagers, hyperspectral infrared sounders, visible to near infrared imagers. Some of those will be hyperspectral in the 10-year time frame. Uh, active and passive microwave imagers, sounders, GPS will have LIDAR. We already have cloud and precipitation radars, and we'll begin to put lightning mappers on geostationary satellites. They're already on the TRIM satellite, which gave us the idea that, gee, this would be a good idea to move to geostationary orbit. Lots of different information, all of which can be used for various atmospheric phenomena. The geostationary constellation will become uh, more robust particularly in your hemisphere, because we expect the Russians to have an electro satellite, you to continue your FY series, GMS, uh, Meteo set will have a rapid scan, uh, the coverage over the Indian Ocean, uh, again, we're not sure what Meteo set uh, will do here, it will require a consortium of people in that uh, viewing area to actually help with that. Uh, the GOES series, we're unclear about what's happening with GOES R uh, sounder, but we will certainly maintain our main two imaging functions. And our spare GOES satellite plant, current plans cause, call for us to continue to look at the uh, South American area by moving to 60 degrees with that. So we plan that coverage. We will improve the, uh, we'll go with the MEDOP, the NPO satellites in an early, very early morning. Right, this is a Terminator orbit AM plus the afternoon orbit. The FY3, you're moving to a two uh, satellite system that will become a part of this rich polar system here that will be the operational polar system. We'll have a MEDOP, early morning and afternoon MPOS, two FY3 satellites, a Meteor satellite in that, uh, in that orbit. We will have an advanced uh, advanced dynamic mission in the AM orbit, more orbit, flying a Terminator mission, that's for winds, it's a LIDAR. Uh, global precipitation mission, the GPS, we hope will uh, continue. Uh, we will have a uh, mission that gives us uh, sea level salinity, or s salinity as well as soil moisture, a GCOM mission uh, for looking at uh, atmospheric constituents, uh, Cryosat, which will look at uh, polar ice very well. Uh, the Russians will continue the research system. The IRS, AOLS, and GOSAT missions, all very specialized missions we'll look at in just a minute. So, when I said there's going to be an increase, there's going to be a real increase. You can't have all of the stuff all of the time. It's like going to one of your Chinese banquets. You have to eat very carefully because you can't eat everything on the table. Some of us might try to eat everything on the table, but you just can't do it. The vision for the GOSS in 2015 is being revisited, uh, but there will be operational geostationary satellites, some with hyperspectral sounders, all will be multispectral. There will be a, a rich array of low Earth orbiting satellites, uh, some with conical microwave scanners, uh, scatterometers, uh, radio occultation, and they're going to be R&D satellites, uh, constellations for radio occultation, there's going to be wind LIDAR, active and passive microwave precip instruments, advanced hyperspectral instruments, uh, perhaps geostationary microwave, this still needs to be uh, investigated as how you move to geostationary microwave, and uh, there'll be much improved intercalibration. The global, uh, cali global satellite intercalibration system is actually now uh, being developed.
to help do intercalibration of the polar satellites as they have common crossing four or five times a month uh, at polar uh, altitudes. But when we go hyperspectral in our geo orbits, then we will have two or three orbits per day of every hyperspectral satellite cross and channel satellite crossing under that geostationary reference plane, and we'll be able to intercalibrate the entire visible near IR micro or uh, an infrared portion of the system. Just intercalibrate that part every single day, two or three times a day. That will be climate quality. That will be operational quality for any NWP, any, any intelligent human being on the planet will be able to use that data when we intercalibrate the system. We will have active microwave in a prograde orbit under flying the microwave sensors. Uh, it will also have its own passive microwave, and we will have a very well characterized microwave system. So our ability to uh, interrogate this planet over the next uh, 10 or 15 years will increase dramatically. I wish I were 20 years younger, because if I were the age of most of you in this audience, you are looking at an era of uh, precise, high quality information coming from a space-based observing system that will give you opportunities to do things that today people like Paul, Professor Shu, myself dream of doing. Maybe we'll still be around to help, but we won't be able to get our hands into the data quite as much as you do. But the challenges facing you are wonderful. A life without challenge is a life not worth living. You have a uh, wonderful, wonderful opportunity in life ahead of you with this system. And you need to work with Young June to make sure that you get data in from the entire space-based observing system. And you utilize that to the maximum. You've got to make that opportunity available. You can't, you just can't let some other people do it. Everybody's going to do it. That's going to change the way we do business as a global community. And I'll come to that in a slide in a moment. We have to change the way we do research. We have to change the way we do operations. We have to change the way we do research, uh, applications. And everybody's got to play their role. And everybody wants to be a uh, major player in this. Oh, my goodness, am I ever running a little bit behind time. We're going to go over this about three other times in lectures. But it's very important to realize, as Paul showed you in the uh, slides and the presentation he made, if you choose the right thing spectrally at the right resolution, you can do a lot of uh, different really uh, high-quality observations to learn things about the atmosphere, the land, the ocean. And you do them at the right temporal resolution, uh, you get uh, good information too. So let's see what, it is, what we're talking about. There are four resolutions you need to look at, look at. How often? In time do you look? What size do you look at? That's going to de both of those depend on the phenomena that you're investigating. Spectrally, what wavelengths and their, the width of that wavelength? How broad is a channel or is it a narrow uh, online offline situation? And then uh, all important driver is signal to noise. If you don't have good signal to noise, then it doesn't make any difference to what you look at in here because you won't see the right stuff anyway. Now this is an example I think you can all understand. It's a 30 minute, 15 minute, 5 minute, and 1 minute interval observation of a hurricane eye. And it's not until you get down into the 1 minute intervals that you can actually see for sure there's cyclonic rotation in that eye wall in this case. Some cases you can do it with five minute intervals. Now 30 minute interval is perfectly good for following where the eye is. And if that's all you're interested in, you don't need this. But if you want detailed structure as the storm's coming inland, am I forming vortices along that eye wall? How fast are those vortices moving? Where will those vortices intersect the land and cause maximum damage within that eye wall area versus where there are no vortices? This becomes very important. 
So again, temporal is important. Now, if I'm looking at something like vegetation, uh, land cover, so I want a vegetation and temperature condition index, then I need to look at something on a weekly basis, a large area average, high quality data to get my indices with. But I don't need to look every minute. If I look every minute, I drive myself crazy. So again, temporally is important. What size? How big? Uh, as you go to higher resolution, for example, with thunderstorms or cloud properties, you see a, a much, uh, much higher definition than the phenomena you're looking for. But if you're doing an Earth radiation budget study, you may want a large field of view, not a small one. This is one kilometer resolution of a hurricane's eye. That's 250 meters. I want 250 meters. But I want it at a temporal resolution that allows me to maximize that utilization. Spectrally, Paul talked a lot about spectral information. Vis to near IR in the infrared portion of the spectrum. And also, spectral bands and their applications is another lecture and part of this series that I'm giving tomorrow morning, I think. Or either afternoon, one of the two. Let's look at a few examples of satellite data uses and their successes. And uh, I will talk about the virtual lab, I think, in part of the uh, lectures that I do, but I don't know if specifically I will be able to give a lecture on it, but I have a lecture on the virtual lab that I will leave with Professor Sheehan. Hurricanes. Since the mid-1960s with global photo mosaics, no hurricane or tropical storm went undetected. We developed a Dvorak technique in other ways to really tell us things about the intensity of those storms. Revolutionized tropical storm forecasting. Multi-platform, multi-sensor products. I showed you a multi-platform, multi-sensor product of a hurricane earlier. Remember the winds, the altimetry, the microwave, all of this. How we put that together and utilize it, that really needs one of you young geniuses to figure that out. How do we put this information together to give somebody something they can really utilize so we don't have to look at 30 different pictures of different phenomena? What do we do? How do you get that product that synthesizes what you're really after? And it's going to be from multiple platforms. Uh, thunderstorm top activity. Uh, you remember well, we all know we can, we've seen visible data with overshooting tops. We see the IR, V notches, and cold plumes. We've learned about that in the past. Now we have uh, differences of reflection that's occurring at cloud top by looking at 1.6 and 3.9 microns. And that reflection is because of the size of the ice particles. And isn't it interesting that this V notch here has a different ice particle structure coming out of it than the ones over here. Do, my thoughts are that must mean it has a much stronger updraft. Which, if I were doing severe storm forecasting, I'd say this is severe, and these have yet to attain severe capability. That'd be an initial analysis, anyway. We have products in all different spectral bands. How we handle those products is really going to be dependent on how we handle the data. You cannot look at 35 spectral bands from a geostationary satellite or 15 spectral bands from a geostationary satellite every five minutes and do anything but go crazy. It's just too much information. And then you put the polar data and all the other data in there and you just finally go down and get a PGO. And it, because it's just too much. But what you can do is new, new things with the data. Like uh, new, you can do new things with the data. Uh, various mathematical analyses like Fourier type series, structure function analyses. Come back and put the principal component analysis. And this is a principal component analysis of data that has put together three, it, it took all of the channels, 
and then it put a principal component analysis of all of the channels together. So we had eight or nine major principal components. And then we combined three of those principal components to show us the different information. And when we do that, we can see low level moisture, uh, wet ground, we can see uh, boundary layer, uh, dry air uh, to unstable area, air. We can locate cirrus cloud versus cumulus cloud and even see differences in thunderstorm top. This is not just, just adding two channels together. This is doing a mathematical analysis of the channels and putting together the unique information of the channels and then going and doing an analysis. New ways of analyzing data so you get one product to show multiple things. Research needs to be done in this area. Multi-platform, multi-sensor products for things like rainfall. Uh, enhanced observations of ocean areas. Certainly those are already happening. We'll have higher resolution SST. With geostationary capability, we'll be able to follow the ocean eddies and watch them move and develop. It's very important for shipping, for example, and the ocean wind field. Uh, chlorophyll. We can look at some of the primary production that occurs in the oceans to see those that are rich for fishing and not. And I bet many of you didn't know that just like around the uh, globe in this latitude longitude area, there's a desert over the oceans. Substance, the substance region, the desert, there is, you go fishing out here, you're going to starve. We're able to use things like synthetic aperture radar to look at ice edge, ice edge movement. We can also follow icebergs. Luckily, these occur in polar regions, so you get multiple coverage. Isn't, isn't that amazing to be able to watch a change in the ice edge and follow iceberg uh, movement? We can look at the health of the planet by monitoring the change in the size of the ozone hole. And we can combine things like altimetry. Here you see the sea level height getting high, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in the onset of an El Nino year. And here we actually see the return current that occurs with the onset of La Nina. Now, this is three hourly, uh, or it's daily cloud cleared SST made from three hourly satellite data. And actually, it's an anomaly field. But with the new satellites, you can do this if you want to process the data every 30 minutes. Cloud cleared SST. And you can watch ocean temperature and its changes in time from geo very, very accurately. Not doing it. We're making a mistake in not doing it. It's not that hard. NWP. Satellite data are the heart of modern NWP systems. From ocean surface winds, hyperspectral, passive microwave has had a huge impact. Most NWP systems can't very well use global rainfall right now. Polar atmospheric motion vectors are making an impact too. To understand the impact on NWP, you can look at this diagram. Now, this is the equator, and this is for over the U.S. Same for over China. This is 60 degrees south. And what you see very clearly for a region like this, for a one-day forecast, you need to be out over the ocean area two to four days out here and globally for five to seven days. This is misleading. And I'll tell you why it's misleading. Because 80% of the information and an assimilation system is in the background field. And that background field develops over time. So the satellite data that you have in a background field from five days ago becomes important even for a one-day forecast. You don't recreate that field every time you turn around. A variety of data, I've already shown you this, from aqua to the polar winds to the geostationary uh, atmospheric motion vectors. Uh, these are having major impacts 
at INSEP. They're having major impacts at ECMWF, the atmospheric motion vectors. We appreciate those that come from CMA or NSMC. Let's see if I, for some reason, this thing doesn't want to go to the next uh, next slide. Pardon me a minute while I do something I don't like to do. Hmm. Let's check and see what's wrong with the computer. Go to a task manager. It says it's running. All right, well, run right. There you go. All right, if you want more satellite technical information page, you can go to the WMO Space Program and get that. Their website's changed since I made this slide, so all I'll tell you is go to the CGMS uh, Coordination Group for Meteorological Satellites. Professor Shu can certainly show you where that is. And you can then get information on geostationary, polar, uh, missions, plans, so forth. You can even link in to the virtual laboratory. You have your own link here. So what are we getting with our satellite uh, system? We're getting new capabilities, more spectral bands, higher spatial and temporal resolution, and these are all across the spectrum. What do we need? New approaches? There have to be national and international partnerships. Without the national and international partnerships, moving forward will not occur at the pace that we can best benefit the people that, uh, that we serve. Training for full utilization. What are we going to look at? Paradigm shifts. What a paradigm is, is the way you do business now. But there are changes in that way you do business now. A dynamic research component with a powerful operational component. Data, it's going to be a dynamic data and product stream. You won't order the same menu for lunch every day. You won't order the same menu for your application. Training and education are absolutely the key to full exploitation. U.S. missions leading to the future global observing system. Uh, in this time frame, we'll have impose, or in the time frame, this is slipped. <laughs> but we're going to be hyperspectral. We're going to be looking at geo microwave, maybe, uh, synthetic aperture radar. In Europe, uh, the MSG, the MBSAT, we now have MEDOP. We're going to have the cloud LIDAR with ADM. The ALOS will give, uh, give us uh, soil moisture. It's not geo, that's global uh, salinity. Um, the Japanese missions, they'll have the GOSAT uh, for greenhouse gases. The ALOS, which is very good for land uh, observing. Uh, new precipitation missions. The Russian Federation will continue along the way with their research system. Hyperspectral IR and synthetic aperture radar. The Indian missions will continue with the INSAT and the IRS follow-on missions will be there. And the Chinese missions will go, will be looking at hyperspectral, conical microwave, and new initiatives. So we're really in for a, uh, a treat with satellite data of the future. And I hope we're up to the task of full exploitation. Thank you.